Okay, our next interview is with Ken Gloss, who is the proprietor and owner of the Brattle Bookshop on West Street in Boston. And um, Ken, I, I guess how you got into the book business was because your father was in the book business. But tell us, tell us uh, when you first got the bug. Well, I mean, I literally, my parents say my first word was book. <laughs> who knows? Maybe it was. I mean, they were talking about it all the time. But I worked after school in elementary school, junior high school, high school, summers during college. Uh, I actually have a degree in chemistry at UMass. I was going to get a doctoral degree at the University of Wisconsin. In 1973, quite honestly, I needed a year off. My father's health wasn't that good. I said I'd take a year off to work at the store. And that was, what, 33 years ago? You, you never left. I <laughs> never left. Uh, and, you know, and I don't regret it. I mean, I'd much rather be doing this than stuck in a laboratory somewhere. Uh, although, to be totally honest about it, if my father had been 10 years old, 10 years younger and healthy, I probably would be a chemist. Uh, yeah. When I first started working at the store, I'd get fired two, three, maybe four times a week. <laughs> uh, you know, and that was on average. And it was funny because what, what would happen is he'd fire me. I'd go upstairs because it was a multi-story building and for about two hours sort of stew and then come downstairs sort of sheepishly. My father would still be upset with me but sort of slink around the store. And after about six months or nine months of doing that, I realized, wait a minute, he just fired me. Why don't I just leave and take the day off? <laughs> and as I started doing that, I got fired less and, and less, less and less. less. But, but about a year after I started work, my father had major heart surgery. And this was 1974. And he was literally out of work about a year. I remember. And um, in that year, I ran the store. And it ran. And it ran well. And, and he never fully recovered his strength. Yeah. Uh, even though he was at the store for another 11 years, yeah, his, his health went down a hell, but he never, and so more and more and more. There were still personalities, there were still conflicts. Uh, I could even tell the story if you want about how we bought the building. Sure. Uh, we, we owned a building on West Street. I mean, we've had many moves, but this is in my year. We owned a building on West Street February of 1980, I got a call at 4 in the morning. The building burned to the ground. It was a five-story, 150-year-old oh, wow. wooden building. Literally, it burned to the ground. We rented a few doors away. Uh, within a month, we reopened with folding tables. Uh, people either gave, sold us, donated books. Kevin White, who was the mayor, mayor. at the time, came down with a carload of books. But mm. even though it was meager, we got open within a month, and that was the main thing. Four years after that, we built the stock, but we, uh, we were offered the building next to the lot where the building burnt down. And it was a good deal, but the person who was selling it wanted it done quickly. And I knew at that point, if I had come to my father and said, they're going to pay us to take their building from them, he would have said no. <laughs> it, it wouldn't have made any difference. It just, he would have said no. So what I did was uh, my our lawyer, who my father liked, who was a collector since he was nine years old and coming in the store, knew real estate. I went to the lawyer and I said, do you know anybody who is a consultant on family real estate and that? The man came in, looked, you know, I said, get him, have him look at the building, evaluate the building, evaluate our lease, and give a report. Joyce and I went to the Caribbean for 10 days, came back, and my father had this great idea to buy a building. <laughs> and Amazing that, how that happened. But if I had gone to him directly, there was no way it would have worked. So I had learned over the years how to do it. And, uh, and now that we own our building and we own the lot next to it, we can have outside tables. We have two floors of general books, a third floor of rare books. And uh, that's really what keeps the business going at this point because the downtown has improved so much that the area has proved so much that the property values have gone up that if we were renting, we'd be in big trouble. But we own, and so we smile. Yeah, I, I would imagine that you would be smiling. Um, when you first got into the business, Ken, do you, what are some of your recollections of, of the trade when you first became a bookseller or during that period when your father was ill and, and subsequently? Well, yeah, in other words, not going back to the you know, the 1950s when I was no, a young kid. And, no, but, you know, but, but even, uh, you know, uh, even when I was in high school, I remember people like Jake Blank coming in and 
and so on. But when I first started and I was running it, I mean, the big difference was it was, uh, it was a general used bookstore with some rare books, not a lot, but some. But one of the big things that would happen regularly is dealers would come in and they'd be paid, you know, whatever their specialty was or even generous, there'd be stacks of books stacking up and boxes being boxed. And this was a relatively regular occurrence. Uh, and that was one of the, the real good parts about the business. Uh, but we do house calls. Much of it is very similar to what I still do. I mean, maybe I'm still running it the old-fashioned way, but uh, we still go out to estates, buying books, bringing the books in, pricing them, putting them out. How people buy them, how they're coming into the store, how the city has changed, it's changed somewhat. Yeah. But going back to that point, it was a lot more the walk-in trade, the dealers coming in from all over the world, all over the country. You'd always have your regulars. I mean, we still have our regulars. Some, regular. of the same, some of the same regulars. We even have one regular who calls in sick when he doesn't show up. <laughs> I mean, you know, That's pretty you, good. You, so you shouldn't worry about it. And, 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 <laughs> quite honestly, yeah, and he shouldn't worry that we'll put that book on the shelf that day and he'll miss it. Uh, and you still get your characters. You still get the people who, for good, for bad, whatever, are real characters. And that's one of the things that... Uh, is one of the fun parts about the business. What about um, the, the fact that you have an open shop um, and it's very heavily trafficked? Do you have a lot of problems with theft? Uh, well, with theft, I imagine we do. Uh, you but know, you it, it's it, you know we have outside tables at a dollar and three and five, and, and they're not monitored. People just bring the books in, and people ask me out there, "Do you have trouble with theft?" I said, "I imagine we do, but." You know, quite honestly, at the end of a lot of days, if the thief would come by, I could suggest, why don't you take, <laughs> take this these. one and take that one? <laughs> yeah, right. And so on. Uh, in the store, we try to have people leave bags and all that. There has to be theft. We don't notice it terribly. I think, you know, there has to be some. On our third floor, the doors are alarmed so people can't go up there without a, an employee. Right. But even up there, you tend to notice it. It does happen. It does happen occasionally. Uh, it happens. You have an open store. There's That's, not. The really happen. rare, the very, very valuable, uh, not out and open and available. That's more if I know somebody or what they're buying looks like what they might be interested. I'll say, gee, would you be interested in this? And then we'll bring it out and show it to them when you get to the much higher end. The other thing that's sort of a corollary to that is not theft, but just handling. You know, yeah, you, there's yeah. some books that are fragile enough right. that, that you're not afraid of them being stolen. You're just being afraid of them worn being out. Abused and, 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 and well, not, it's just wear and tear and handling. So that's another reason that we're careful. But uh, there, and if you get somebody who is a really good thief, I mean, they really know about know their it. business. Know their <laughs> business. It's almost impossible yeah. to stop in any setting. Uh, but yeah, it happens. I see you had you have video some kind of like video surveillance in part of the store. Uh, we do, yeah. We, does it work or is it just a show? Uh, some of it works, some of it doesn't. <laughs> I've been talking about improving it, uh, but yeah, it, it does to an extent. It's not a hundred percent, it depends on the angles. Quite honestly, we put it in a number of years ago, the technology has improved so much yeah, yeah. that we're, we've been talking about putting in better, uh, better items. One of the things that you do, Ken, that a lot of people don't, is you make a lot of appearances at, uh, at clubs, uh, like, the, like you appeared at the Sharon Garden Club, <laughs> which I attended. Uh, and uh, do you find this to be a useful way to get stuff and get customers? Well, in one way, yes, and in one way, no. Uh, one of the things I really did learn from my father, because he used to appear on the GBH, Channel 2 uh, all the time. auction, the uh, public television. He used to be on the radio shows all the time. Doing, He didn't do as many lectures, but he did do some. And one of the things I really learned from him, almost more than the book part of it, was that getting your name out there, that getting publicity. the publicity does help. I think one of the fortunate parts about it is it doesn't help immediately. And the reason I say that's fortunate, in other words, I don't go, I do a lot of talks I usually limit myself to two a month in the evenings because if you did more than two a month, especially when my children were young, you'd never be home. Yeah. Uh, 
I also sometimes speak once or twice during the day because while well, I'm away at work anyways. But when I do these talks, I try to entertain. I don't try to teach because people would fall asleep if I try to teach. But where the effect is, is people think I go to these talks and I drive away with a truckload of rare books. Almost never do I get any immediate response. Almost never. Uh, but what will happen is five years from the talk, ten years from the talk, you know, you might get a call, and the people don't even remember where they saw you or how they saw you. And one of the reasons I say that's good is if you got that immediate response, I'd probably have a lot more competition in doing it. Yeah, uh, I really think you know, so. You know, but also, it's a lot of work. It is. I mean, I get to work at 6 in the morning most weekdays. You know, when it's 5.30 and I'm not driving home, and I'm driving to Williamstown, Mass., or something like that, and I'm getting home at midnight, it's a long, long, it's a lot of work. I also have uh, paid public relations people who, when we're doing these talks, I actually pay way more than uh, most of the talks are free. I pay five hundred, a thousand dollars a talk almost to, in, to, in yeah. publicizing it. That's another factor. Um, I also noticed that uh, in the last several years that you've been affiliated with the Antiques Roadshow. That's a lot of fun. Boy, is that a lot of fun to do. But yes, I, uh, it's been eight years now that I've done it, and uh, I do about half of the shows. Uh, they, now they're on a schedule where they do six shows. They film them between June and August. They show them between January and March, so it's the summertime that you're going out. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I only do six shows, uh, three shows or four is I do them all, except that they have more book appraisers than they have slots for appraisers, so they dole it out somewhat. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, you get to go to Omaha, Bismarck, uh, Oklahoma. You get to go. Well, <laughs> no, but you know, almost any of those areas you go around the country, the people are nice, the right. area is nice. If you go for a long weekend, like in, I usually try now with Joyce and I, uh, we go out a day or two early. We'll drive two or three hours to the national parks. We'll see the museums in town. You know, maybe two weeks in Bismarck would be too long. But three or four days is great. And the other thing that you have there is that you, um, the other appraisers, you have 75 other appraisers who want to do things too. So you have people, friends to go out to dinner with. And then the appraisals and the show itself, you appraise from about 7.30 in the morning sometimes to 6, 7 in the evening nonstop with two other or three other appraisers, usually two in the books. And I've made great friends with the other appraisers. Mm -hmm. I don't leave Boston that much. I don't do all the book fairs, the book shows, because I made a decision early in my career that I could spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and love it, but I'd never be home. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I've made the decision that in Boston, I'm very active. In the New England area, I'm very active. But I don't go and do the Los Angeles show, the New York show, the Chicago right. show, the because it'd be exactly. way too much. I also buy very little at auction. And one of the reasons isn't that I don't think I could buy aggressively, competitively, uh, and so on. It's because most auctions are either weekends or evenings. I, want, I made that decision. I was going to be home with my family. And part of it was, of course, I'm fortunate enough that we do get enough house calls yeah. that you know, I can sound great. If we weren't getting those house calls, maybe I would be working weekends, evenings, nights at auctions, and so on. But the Antiques Roadshow, though, it's a lot of fun at this stage. My children have grown up, and it's great PR for the shop. Oh, now, they pay zero. Uh, a uh, lot yeah. of people think they don't pay airfare, hotel, meals, nothing. But it's great PR. It's great uh, thing. And the reality is I've gotten more business out of that show from referrals from the other appraisers than yeah. I have people in the public yeah. saying, I saw you on TV, why don't you come out to my house, or so on. The other effect that I get out of it that's nice, though, is if I'm appearing at the local library uh, in Sharon, whatever, if they know that I'm on the Antiques Roadshow, maybe the announcement in the paper goes from this size to maybe that right. size. You know, most people wouldn't think of that as a benefit, but it, it's, I, we love it, we enjoy it. Uh, Joyce has done a show, uh, but it, what I really love is seeing the country. Yeah. Um, is it a safe assumption to make, Ken, that you get the vast majority of your material from house calls rather than from auction or from going to other dealers? 
Uh, the, the, yeah, that would be a very good assumption. In matter of fact, probably 95% of it. Yeah, that uh, people do bring books in. I yeah. mean, people walk off the street. They have a car that they've driven in. They have a bag of books. They have a few books here or there. But because of that decision I made early on not to go to the auctions, mm -hmm. not to travel around the country scouting, as many other dealers have had, we, I would say we average, uh, most of the buying we do is weekdays. Uh, rarely do I go out on a Saturday or Sunday. Someone calls, they have a Gutenberg Bible, they have to yeah. sell cheap. They say, you have to come out on Sunday. You know, you, I'd be you there. Do it. I, I'd be there. You but do it. we probably average six to eight, some weeks even, ten calls a week. So on days, we'll leave at nine in the morning and we'll go from one to the other to the other, two and three in a day. Now, if, if the call has two or 3,000 books in it, maybe we'll only do one that day. Mm -hmm. But it's not unusual at all for us to do six to eight calls a week. And the really unusual day is the day that we don't go out on a call. Right. And it's a sad day, I would imagine. Well, it, it, sometimes you, it's a day to catch your breath and try to get through the piles and piles and piles of yeah. stuff that you've gotten. Ken, uh, are there any booksellers, living or dead, who you would have considered as a mentor other than your dad? Well, it, you know, what I feel in the book business is it's such an individual business mm, that almost everybody, when you look into it, does it somewhat differently, does it different ways. So I wouldn't say that there's really a mentor outside of it because I grew up with it. I sort of was bang into it when I decided to take that year off. Uh, so I know how my father's business run. In many ways, though, I looked at a, a company like Goodspeeds, which was one of the major businesses. Arnold Silverman, who I've known all my life or knew all my life, Later. really was very nice to me in sort of trying to help and show. Quite honestly, what I learned in many cases from watching Goodspeeds is many things not to do. I, I mean, in many ways, it was, <coughs> but I could read back and see what they had done and what I thought was right. One of the greatest things that I think when I first got into the business was at the Morgan Memorial Sale, for 10 cents a piece, they had a complete set of the month at Goodspeeds. And I read every page of that. An thing. excellent and I, and I cannot think of a better thing to read if you're a starting book dealer to try to get from 1929 to the mid-60s and just read through. You'll learn more American history. Absolutely. You'll be mind blown. So maybe just reading the month at Goodspeeds. But I also remember uh, Jake Blank, who did the bibliography of American literature, was a friend and uh, used to come in all the time, and he'd give me pointers. But a lot of, I don't think there was any one person in that sense because uh, I sort of watched it. Or even uh, watching uh, like someone like Peter Stern, who worked at Star Bookshop, which was a very similar to my right. father's, but how he could turn that around and become one of the top dealers in the country. And you sort of watch and see what works and what doesn't work. And, and sometimes watching what doesn't work is as important as what does work. I, I agree. Uh, Ken, what aspects of the book business do you think have changed since the so-called Internet Revolution? Well, I think that general used secondhand bookstores, because of the Internet res Revolution, I would think over the next five, seven years, the two-thirds, three-quarters of them are just going to go out of business. I mean, you just can't compete. Uh, one of the things that I liken it to, and the Internet, when it first started, I think was a boon for a lot of dealers. Uh, I think, though, now that there are 40, 50 million books online, it's, it's cut out the middle. Uh, what I, the way I envision the book business, if, if you think about it, what people are really paying me for or the dealer for is the going out and gathering all of this together. Mm -hmm. Now, your knowledge is important. Not as much so as we'd like to think, I yeah, think, in some yeah. cases. But it's the gathering together so that you have this when your customer, your person, whoever it is, comes together. The Internet now is much more efficient at gathering it together. So you, the premium that people were paying the second-hand bookstore to gather all this together, the Internet's more efficient. Prices have plummeted. There are a lot of sort of mid-level dealers who would come to me, and they'd buy books for... 10, 15, 5, 20 dollars, and then be able to know the right customer and pay 50, 75, 100, maybe even three or 400. But a lot of that's cut out because 
when my father first started out, and I remember as a young boy going to, the books were used books. Mm -hmm. They ca became, in the last 20, 25 years, collectible. Now they're used books. And, and that's, Always uh, used uh, books. No, no, but <laughs> what I'm saying is, rather than being sort of pricey collectible, they're going back to being just used books. And that's because the Internet's efficient. It, whether you like it, you don't yeah, like it, it whatever, it. it's here, and, and that's changed a lot. And that's why we don't get the dealers, the scouts, coming in every day and so on. Uh, I think I'll survive by attrition. Uh, we own our property. We're secure yeah. in that. More book dealers go out of business. I get called to buy their stock many times. But also, if there aren't as many people out there buying books, the thing that really drives the business is getting out to the houses, the estates. I liken it to being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island every oh, yeah. day. But if there are less dealers competing that way, I'll get more calls. So I'll probably survive that way. But uh, the Internet is changing. And I think the big, huge, huge change is going to be when a project, whether it be Google or the others, actually have scanned all of Harvard and Michigan and the BPL. Right. And all of that information is out there. Yeah. And I, that might be 10, 20 years down the road. That's going to change. The other thing that's changing is that when we were growing up, you'd read a book, and that book would somehow click. It would be like an icon. I think the younger kids nowadays, I think they're reading just as much. They're just reading differently. They're reading computer screen. I don't think it's necessarily worse, better, bad. It's just totally different. And when they get older, you know, is all the king's men, is Catcher in the Rye, is Dickens going to be the icon that they'll go out and buy a first edition mm -hmm. for eight, ten. You know, that's changing, although you talk to some people, and the book might even become more precious as an artifact. As an artifact, but, object, but yeah. it's different. Also, is the city or college uh, president or mayor going to say, when the librarian comes to you and says, I, w I need 200,000 square feet in a new building, they're going to go, it's all available online or in a yeah. disk, and we can fit all that information in, in, into in one box. Uh, in one box. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that that's not better, that the information's out there and easier to get. It's just different. Yeah. Kenny, if, if you were going into the book business today, how would you do it? If I was going into the book business today, I'm not sure how I'd do it. Uh, you know, one of the easiest things to say is, the way it's been, I've done very well. I'm very happy. I don't, you know, all of this, what I'm saying with the internet, I'll adjust. But I already own the property. I already own the building. Uh, I would say that I would probably, I, I work hard. I work long hours. I love what I do. I would probably use what I know about promoting myself and promoting whatever to try to use that to get people to give me books. Uh, or sell books or get books. Uh, I was talking to somebody recently uh, who um, they have a business and they, they just get books free. They go to library sales and say, after the sale, I'll take all the books. Yeah. Uh, the advertising for this business I have a lot of problems with because it sounds like a donation or charity I think is a little deceiving. But ultimately, from what I can tell, this guy's making money by taking all the books that people don't want going to realtors, going to uh, house demolition companies, going to people who move people out. A lot of these people aren't as concerned about the price they're getting for the book as you'll just get rid of them. A lot of the charities don't accept them anymore. Yep. And he's so. making a business of this. And you know, I'm actually going to have a meeting with him and sit down with him and say, how are you doing this? Uh, and he's making a problem. It's a totally different way of doing I know. it. know, it's incredible. But, but you know, maybe I'd say to myself, that's the way to do it now. One key, though, point of it is a lot of what he sells is online, and he will only sell books that have ISBN numbers. So that means anything before the 60s or is it's, not, it's, it's like, remote. it's just a headache. Yeah. Because it all depends on the computer and fast right. analysis. Maybe I'd do something like that. Maybe. I'd go to work for somebody and try to figure out how they're doing it and so on. I don't know whether I would be the one, though, dealing in the upper, upper end. Because if you're just starting out, you've got to find that niche, unless you've got millions of dollars to start with. 
That's for sure. Kenny, let me just uh, finish off by asking you, uh, can what in this, some one great buy stand in your mind or one great disappointment uh, stand oh, well. in your mind from your long career? I, I mean, the problem is I can tell story after story yeah. after story. Just, just I, I mean, if you, if you want to, uh, two or three things, if you ask me what's some of the nicest and best and uh, wonderful and things I've enjoyed, we bought a full set of Curtis's Indians about 25 years ago. And I mean, they're all the text, all the 720 plates. Wow. Uh, we bought it. I brought it home. Joyce and I spent a weekend, one page at a time, one print at a time, going through the whole book. You know, normally you see those. You go to a museum. They have 50, 60 of them yeah. framed and up on the wall. We spent the week. I couldn't afford to keep it. I just <laughs> couldn't afford to keep it. Now, at the time, I sold it for a little over $100,000. Now it's selling for a little over a million dollars. I wish I could have afforded to keep it. But uh, another item that I got that a lot of times I would bring things home to the, my daughters and I'd show it to them. Oh, Dad's brought another Audubon. Dad's mm -hmm. brought it. You know, and it was like a, I went into a house and they were just finishing up. They were about to throw away the last trunk. Now, by the time I got there, they knew what they had. They had I had been called in by a museum, but they found at the bottom of the last trunk 10 letters of Thomas Jefferson. Wow. They also had other letters too, but in one of those letters, Jefferson was talking about how to treat traitors and terrorists. And this was, he actually used those words. And this was just after 9-11. I brought that letter home. I showed it to my daughters. And they go, wow. And you know, you're holding a letter that Thomas Jefferson once held. He thought about this. I deal with this. It still sends a tingle up my spine. Me but too. the minute my daughters said, wow, I really knew I had something yeah, then. Something you know, great. so. And this was in what Jefferson said was they should be treated fairly and given the complete fair treatment under the law and absolutely nothing else. But he emphasized they should get the full fair treatment of the law. One other story I'll tell, and this is sort of a general story about book buying and selling. We recently bought a library in the Boston area. I went out, I bid on it. A few weeks later, I got the call, we accept your bid. So I came out with two of my assistants who had worked with me for a year or so. Went to this house, it was an old house, but when we got there, there was one of the bookcases had been emptied, it moved about 45 degrees away from a wall. Someone had obviously taken a sledgehammer and knocked the wall out big enough so people could walk through it. They go, you know, there's more books upstairs. The wall, the house had been separated. So we bought the books we were gonna buy. They said, come and look at the books upstairs. We went up, and there was actually some really nice books up there. We went up there. I bought those books. We boxed them up. We carried them down, went back through the wall, out to the car, and put them away. And we were driving away. I said to my employees, do you know what was really strange about that? It wasn't that there was a hole in the wall, that a bookcase had been moved, that we went up. I said, we just did it. We didn't even take note of the fact that we're walking through holes in the wall. It was nothing didn't, unusual. Didn't it was a just a you. typical day. A day, a day I said, that's battle. what's unusual, is that we didn't even take note of it. <laughs> so, and, and you could go on with story after story, but that's what makes it fun. The people, the characters, the who you're going to meet, what you're going to do. The, well, just and in, and in, that's what keeps it going. In closing, Kenny, could you just, uh, if you had to make a sentence or two to give somebody advice, what would you recommend? What would you well, say to one, a young bookseller who, who was in the trade? What, what would you give him advice? One, one of the things that I emphasize, I'm, we were just talking about all the stories, all the romance of it, all of that. Now, I did talk about getting consultants in with buying buildings and all that. It's a business. If you forget that it's some sort of romantic trade, some sort of, oh, these books are so, yeah, that's good. It's a business. If you're going to be successful, you've got to realize it's a business. If you're there to make money. And if the minute you lose sight of that, that, oh, this is so precious, this is so wonderful, they might be so wonderful, but if you're not making money and you're not making a profit, you're not going to be successful. So it's a lot of hard work. It can be a lot of fun. I enjoy, I couldn't do anything else at this I point. Now, but I emphasize more than anything else. You know, we're not a big store. We have eight or ten employees. We have insurance bills. We have water bills, tax bills, uh, phone bills. And managing eight or ten people 
you know, on the scale of Gillette or something, it's nothing. But it is a business, and you lose sight of that. And that's, I think, the most important thing that I can emphasize. No matter how you do the books, it's a business. Great. Thank you very much, Ken. Okay. Thanks, very Mike. entertaining.